Hello, everyone. Um, I know you can't see me, or you can see me, but I can't see you. So I'll assume you're all very happy today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Garon as our second seminar speaker this semester, uh, virtually. Uh, Jennifer is a new postdoc in my lab, uh, working on the Coleoptera anatomy ontology. And at the same time, she is the acting collections manager at Texas Tech University in their invertebrate zoology collection. And Jennifer started her academic career at the Universidad de Valle in Cali, Colombia, uh, where she got her bachelor's degree, and then moved over to the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, uh, where she did a master's uh, in biology, but on uh, entomine or broad nosed weevil systematics uh, with. Uh, person Nico Franz, who's now at Arizona State. And I knew about her at the time because um, I talked to Nico and he said, I've got this student, Jennifer, and she's already a better morphologist than I am. Uh, okay, that's good to know. So, uh, and then after her master's, uh, Jennifer took a hard left and went to the University of Kansas uh, in Lawrence and did her PhD on uh, water scavenger beetles, on hydrophilids. Um, so she's worked on a, a lot of beetle groups, uh, at least two big ones, I should say. Uh, and her work has involved evolutionary biology, systematics and taxonomy, uh, diagnostics, uh, but all of it has come back uh, and had a central focus on morphology. Uh, and she is a uh, very detail oriented uh, and has also uh, really worked at linking research projects together and making them shareable to the broader public, which is something that we should all get better at, and she already has. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Giron. And thank you for coming. Well, thank you, Aaron, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this seminar today. And thank you, everyone, for joining this morning to hear all about beetle pieces. So let's start with uh, an outline of what this talk is going to be. I'm going to talk about uh, several studies where, that have involved uh, beetle morphology in different ways. Uh, the first one is a study that I started as an undergrad in Colombia working with broad-nosed weevils over there, uh, where morphology was used mostly for diagnostic purposes. So how to identify and recognize different groups. Then we are going to move to the Caribbean, where I did a couple of studies uh, using morphology for phylogenetic purposes, um, and partly revising a couple of genera. Then we are going to talk about a little bit uh, about uh, water scavenger beetles and why their morphology can trick you very easily. And lastly, we are going to talk about the project that I'm uh, developing at Purdue with the Coleoptera anatomy ontology. And so just to start with a simple question, why do I want to study morphology? A uh, couple of reasons. First, that it's relatively accessible and cheap to do it, to study morphology in general. Once you have a stereo microscope available and some specimens you would are essentially set up to start looking at uh, morphological structures. But then the uh, next component is that morphology is just amazing. It's an amazing tool to study different things. So for, for example, here you have the cephalic capsule of a water beetle and what you see here is the tentorium, which is the structure that holds the entire structure together. And it's a structure that not many people even think of, uh, very often at least. Um, the other reason is that morphology can really surprise you every time. So for example, here is a weevil mandible where it's essentially a sclerotized block. But then when I started looking at mandibles of water beetles, they have all this uh, CT and they have CT on top of the CT and they have 
like different regions that are uh, performing different functions in the when they are feeding. So when I started looking at these things, it was just like mind blowing to me. How can a mandible have CT on top of CT? So it's a uh, very nice uh, morphology. is a really nice way to uh, get at different questions with not a lot of resources. But if you have uh, more resources available, you can look at, for example, uh, scanning electron microscopy that allows you to look at the surface of your different structures. And here, for example, we have the scales of a weevil. And as you can see, every single scale, ha every single scale has these little ridges all along the surface. You also can use confocal laser microscopy, which allows you to see inside your sclerotized tissue uh, to see, for example, muscles or where articulations are happening. Um, and also, lately, you can use micro CT scanning, where you, when you scan your uh, specimen, you can reconstruct uh, using software different uh, kinds of tissues. So, for example, here in orange, we have muscles. And here in the center, we have the tentorium, which has uh, the same structure as the rest of the cephalic capsule. So you can uh, use different tools depending on what you have available and what are the questions that you want to get at. So let's start with the uh, case studies that I wanted to show you today. The first one, as I mentioned, is about uh, broad-nosed weevils in Colombia. So we have those two components. Uh, talking about the weevils, this is a group that is distributed all across the world, and it has about 14,000 species. So it's a huge group. And the, the other um, thing about them is that each of the 54 tribes that are described or so far in the group, uh, each of them have uh, different distributions and are restricted uh, to particular regions of the world. So for example, in the neotropics, there are 12 tribes represented. If we talk about Colombia itself, it is a big country with, with, that is considered mega diverse because about 10% of the diversity of the planet can be found there. And it has uh, five natural regions. So we have here the Pacific in brown. Uh, it has the Caribbean region at the north the Andean region in the center, which is mountainous, most of it. Then we have the Orinoco, which is the, it's connected to the Guiana Shield. And then in the south, we have the Amazon. So we have a very complex mixture of different ecosystems. And each of these ecosystems has their own unique uh, fauna. And we know, at least for antimines, we know very superficially about. So when I started this uh, work, um, there were 224 species described in the group, all of them representing eight different tribes. Um, but there was a problem and it's that identifying species in this group is really, really complicated. And there are some reasons for that. One, and at the time, which is like 15 years ago when I was an undergrad, um, access to information was very limited. So there was no um, biodiversity heritage library available at the time. So having access to original publications, uh, original descriptions was difficult. There are not many keys available for identifying tribes or genera in this group and, ex and particularly in the neotropics and northern South America is the uh, information that is available is very reduced. And so the other thing is that most of the species are only known from their original descriptions. So many of these things have never been illustrated, for example, so we don't really know what they look like. Then also most of the types, if not all of them, are housed in European collections. So for a non-undergrad in a developing country, trying to go visit European collections was not an option. And then we don't have national specialists, not only for this particular group, but in curculionids in general, and for many other uh, groups of beetles. So it was not 
like you can reach out to someone in your own language to talk about these things. But we do have a few specialists, uh, specialists in the group, uh, international, that are familiar with the neotropical fauna. And then at the time I was um, fortunate enough to have the help of Robert Anderson at the Canadian Museum of Nature. Bob was going to identify my weevils by photos that I would, was going to send him. But then uh, my work was mostly based on those identifications. How do I, uh, what are the characters that I can use for recognizing these different groups of weevils? So in this case, we use, I used morphology with uh, diagnostic purposes. So for example, characters like this um, anterior margin of the pronotum in lateral view, uh, this margin can be uh, forming this little lobe here, or it can be straight as in here. So that's one characteristic that helps you recognize uh, some tribes, including the Lord of Pines. And then uh, also the presence of this uh, CT along this anterior margin of the pronotum is characteristic of the Tanima sign. Other characters that you can use to recognize different tribes and genera include the shape of the eyes, the size, how much they are projected from the surface of the head, the presence of uh, soul, the, uh, this median uh, uh, sulcus in the middle of the head, the configuration um, of the apex of the rostrum, the shape of the antennal scrobes, and even just the uh, with length uh, ratio of the rostrum, all of these features would be helpful to recognize different groups. Other characters include the shape of the pronotum or in its posterior margin, um, the coloration that can be uniform or have uh, different patterns across the dorsal surface of the body. Uh, the presence of these little tubercles on the elytra in some groups can also have uh, the apex of the elytra projected. Um, the shape of the anterior uh, femurs, those characteristics would help you recognize different groups here. So at the time, I only looked at collection at a collection in Valle del Cauca, this department here in green. Um, but over time, I was able to visit different collections in the country. So I have data for uh, different collections in Antioquia, which is here in red, the Alexander von Humboldt collection here in blue, uh, it's located in Boyacá, and a few records from the collection of Charlie O'Brien. So with this, I have right now, I think 750 records of antimines identified the genera, most of them at least. And as you can see, there is a strong overlap of the records that I have with the departments that have been, um, where the departments where these collections have, are located. Most of the Amazon region, the Orinoco region, and the Caribbean region have very few records. So these are areas that need um, more study for this group at least. So over time as well, and with the developing of these new online tools for doing many different things, uh, we are able to recognize a few species uh, fairly easily. So for example, this is uh, Comsus viridivitatus, which is a species associated, uh, recognized as a plague of citrus in Colombia, and uh, their, their coloration is very um, uh, distinct. So you, for example, these pictures that I'm showing you here are all from iNaturalist, so it's uh, easy to just go there and even get new records for things. Then uh, we have Comsus canescens, which is a common species in Bogota. Uh, we were able to identify this because uh, I was able to see the types that uh, Lourdes Chamorro has right now at the US, um, at the Smithsonian. Uh, and then Oxyderces viridipes is one species that is very common in Antioquia uh, especially Medellin and surroundings. So it's, um, those are some of the species that you can recognize uh, right now fairly easily compared to years ago where uh, these kinds of tools were not available. Moving on, 
we are now going to the Caribbean where uh, it is a region that is recognized as a biodiversity hotspot. And uh, because of the high diversity that it has, it also has extremely high levels of endemies. And then you will, uh, I'll tell you about this in a minute. Um, this work, as Aaron mentioned, was done, um, advised by Nico Franz at the, when he was at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and this was part of the research that I did there. So in these cases, morphology was used for phylogenetic um, purposes. And these studies, one of them is about Apoderosus. This genus, as you can see, is fairly uh, uniform in the shape of the head, the configuration of how the eyes and the rostrum are organized and the shapes of those. And uh, the other group was Lagnopus, which is as you can see, extremely heterogeneous in many different ways. So, for example, for Apoderosus, we started with two species that were described, both of them from Puerto Rico. Uh, Apoderosus Wolcotti was described from mountainous regions in the island, and Argentatus was described from uh, coastal areas. Uh, so we borrowed specimens from different collections and were able to describe 11 new species, some of them found in Hispaniola, which is the island that is composed of Haiti and the Republic, some of them from the Bahamas, and one or two from the Turks and Caicos Island, which are north of the Dominican Republic. And as you can see, there's a lot of variation in colorations, in patterning uh, on those colors, but usually they would have approximately or very similar shape of the head. Characters that we used for this analysis included the length of the antennal escape, the presence of this uh, little fovea on the last abdominal segment, um, the condition of the elytral stria 9 and 10 that could be separated as in here or fused together as in here, um, and the shape of the spermatica. So all of these characters were used for a phylogenetic analysis based on parsimony, where we found a lot of homoplasious characters, like most of our groupings were supported by uh, homoplasious characters. But even with this, we were able to find two different clades, uh, one of them uh, from highlands and the other one from lowlands. And so we were also, we were finding uh, members of these, these two different clades in different islands, particularly in Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. The other group that we looked at, uh, Lacnopus, is the largest genus of broad-nosed weevils in the Caribbean and the most widespread, and it has most of the species have been recorded only from a single island. So uh, it has high levels of endemism here. Under the slash, you're going to see the number of endemic species and the, over it, the total number of species for each of these islands. And so as you can see, for example, here, 26 out of 27 species recorded from Hispaniola are exclusive from that island. Um, when we started this study, there were 66 described species in the genus, and we were able to include half of them in this analysis, thanks to Charlie O'Brien, who uh, lent us the specimens to do this study. Some of the characters that we used included the surface of the scales that could be ribbed, as the ones I showed you before, or uh, very smooth. Also, the posterior corners of the pronotum that could be forming a straight angle or an acute angle. Also, the margins of the rostrum that could be parallel, as in here, or apically diverging, as in here. And the shape of the areagus that could be truncated, as in this one, or um, narrowed and rounded, as in this other example. As not a surprise, uh, we found that Lacnopus is not a monophyletic uh, genus, and, but we did find a high correspondence between monophyletic groups 
and their distributions. So for example, here, all of this clade um, is uh, composed of Cuban species, sister to a clade from Puerto Rico. And here we have uh, an entire clade that is exclusive from the Dominican Republic, uh, from Hispaniola. So there is a high correspondence of uh, monophyletic groups are um, sort of isolated in their own island. Later, we were able to do an entire uh, catalog of species um, on this genus. We described uh, six new species in here and uh, to try to organize the mess that this uh, genus is, uh, we define six different species groups. So this group essentially is ready for a full on uh, taxonomic review. Moving on, we are now talking about uh, water scavenger beetles and it's the research that I did for my dissertation uh, directed by Andrew Short in the University of Kansas. Uh, water scavenger beetles belong to the family Hydrophility and when I started this project, I, the only thing I knew about this group was that they usually have longer maxillary pulse than antenna, but then uh, you're going to see later that this is not always true. Uh, hydrophilids are, uh, there are over 3,000 species of hydrophilids described right now. Uh, they are distributed all across the world. There are six subfamilies in hydrophility and they occupy a very broad range of habitats. For example, they can be found in aquatic habitats like ponds and streams where what these beetles do is that they are able to carry this uh, bubble of air on the ventral side of their bodies. And they hold this bubble because they have a um, layer of hairs covering their entire uh, thorax and abdomen and part of their femurs. So they go to the surface, refill their bubble, submerge in their water, and they are able to swim around the water column. You can also find hydrophilids in hygropetric habitats. And this is uh, uh, mostly represented by seepages, which is this layer, thin layer of water that runs over uh, the surface of rocks, usually by rivers. And then in this case, the beetles don't have a column of water to swim around in, but what they do is that they crawl over the surface of the rock, submerged in this thin layer of water. And lastly, we have hydrophilids in terrestrial habitats, which are usually associated with rotten vegetation or other decaying matter that is uh, necessarily wet. So in, across the phylogeny of hydrophilids, uh, there is a trend to move from uh, fully aquatic environments to terrestrial environments. And you can see here, the size of this circle represents the um, proportion of species that is represented in a particular environment. So at the top of the tree, you have uh, groups mostly represented in aquatic environments. When you get here to the bottom, you can see that most of these species, uh, most these groups are mostly represented by species associated with terrestrial habitats. So there has been a habitat shifting across the evolution of the family. So one of the questions that we, that necessarily comes up with this is, how did this happen? For trying to get to answer that, we focused on the Acidocerini which are a family of 14 genera, a subfamily, sorry, of 14 genera composed by about 300 species, which about two thirds of them belong to a single genus called Helocari. Um, for, to answer these questions, we uh, reconstructed a phylogeny for the group, including 216 uh, terminals, with 10 outgroups, and this was reconstructed based on five different genes. Uh, some generalities about acidocerines is that they are very heterogeneous when you look at them at the generic level. So for example, here these beetles are uh, scaled up to each other. 
So you can see that you have very big uh, beetles and very small, and this is not even the smallest. The smallest is like half this uh, beetle here. Um, you have different shapes of the body, so you can have um, ex uh, elytra and pronotum that are expanded laterally. You have very smooth surfaces as in here, or very um, rugose as in here, or strongly sculptured. You have uh, uniform colorations, or uh, this modeled uh, group as well. So there is a lot of variation when you look across the family at the generic level. But once you get down to species level within a genus, you can see that all of those differences essentially disappear. And the only way that you can tell species apart, because the external morphology doesn't help a lot, is the male genitalia. And we found with our studies that um, the male genitalia are uh, is one of the structures that um, has a lot of correspondence with monophyletic groups. Uh, an example of uh, problems that uh, were created by this uh, external morphology being very uniform is that most of the times, and at least in this Elocaris uh, genus that I mentioned before, uh, was that many times external characters that were easy to see uh, were used to separate different uh, subgenera within this genus. So, for example, usually species that were very smooth were placed on uh, Elocaris sensus stricto, whereas species with uh, very well marked um, elytral stria were placed in a different subgenus, in this case, Eurobaticus. And then species that were mostly smooth without stria were uh, grouped together in uh, Elocaris sensus stricto. But then when you look at the genitalia, this grouping really doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It would make more sense to group, if, well, if it was just based on genitalia, uh, to group these two together. And this grouping is actually supported by the molecular data that we got. A different, oh, so all of this, um, Many rearrangements within this particular group are going to be done. Uh, so there's a lot of taxonomic work that needs to happen now after we get our results of the phylogeny published. Uh, other things that happen with acidocerines uh, is that there is a trend in reduction to reduction in certain characters that is associated with habitat. For example, the extension of this coverage of pubescence on the femur. Um, fully aquatic uh, species associated with uh, aquatic environments would have their femurs mostly covered because, as I mentioned, they need to create these bubbles in order to be submerged. And those, uh, that coverage is going to be reduced in uh, specimens that are associated with hygropetric habitats, and it would be essentially absent in uh, terrestrial species. The same happens with the length of the maxillary pulps. So species from aquatic habitats would have longer maxillary pulps. They get shorter in species associated with hydropetric, hydropetric habitats, and they get very short and stout in species from terrestrial environments. So we did uh, studies in character evolution using uh, comparative methods. Uh, we coded several binary characters for morphology. So, for example, the number of antenomeres can be either nine or eight across uh, the acidocerines. Uh, the presence or absence of elytral stria was also a character that we coded, and the presence of this emargination at the end of the abdomen. We also measured some continuous traits, including the length width ratio of uh, this palcomere. And then we also measured the area of the femur that was uh, covered by pubescence. So we also coded this along with um, habitat. And as you can see here, in green would be the hygropetric, in blue, aquatic, and these little two uh, uh, markings here indicate the ones that were coded as terrestrial. And in general, and as I don't have a lot of time to talk about this uh, right now, 
uh, in general, what we found is that all the traits that we evaluated were uh, conserved phylogenetically. So they have strong phylogenetic signal. Uh, hygropetric habitats were important for habitat shifting. So we recovered the ancestor of acidocerines as uh, an inhabitant of hygropetric habitats. And as you can see, there are repeated transitions to aquatic habitats or uh, from hygropetric to terrestrial. And once they shifted towards either extreme, uh, there was no way back from that. Um, also, this habitat shifting was correlated with morphological variability. So here I'm highlighting uh, in this gray background the clades where most of the transitions back and forth, well, the transitions uh, in ecology happened. And here I'm just overlapping one of the characters what, that we looked at, um, the presence or absence of this uh, apical emargination of the abdomen. And as you can see, the transitions in this character essentially coincide with uh, these transitions in habitat. Moving on, uh, I want to talk about the project that I'm um, developing at Purdue with the Coleoptera Anatomy Ontology, working with Aaron and a group of other researchers at other institutions. So let's start by defining what an ontology is. An ontology is basically a form of representation that where you can organize knowledge. So formal, what I mean with this is um, that it's not only language that you can uh, use to communicate with people, but also that computers and machines can process. So for example, if you think of a beetle and you think of describing its morphology, its anatomy, usually one of the ways that you can think about it is that the body is divided in tagmas. Each of these tagmas, we know, uh, head, thorax, and abdomen. Each of those is subdivided in different structures. And each of those structures are also subdivided. And you can also subdivide these subdivisions, right? So this is a hierarchy that helps you understand uh, how these things are organized. But also, you can have an overlapping uh, hierarchy where you have to think about sclerites, membranes, articulations, where you have CT, where you have spines, and different accidents of the uh, cuticle. And you also can think of, uh, would need to think of what is dorsal, what is ventral, what is lateral. So there are overlapping hierarchies here that not necessarily can be managed with a simple database. So there are, uh, we are implement um, kind of borrowing or applying um, different concepts from uh, the semantic web. In this case, for example, um, I'm going to explain, uh, we are applying this knowledge man management base where you have initial data, which is uh, unprocessed information. And this is represented in what we do in, on a daily basis by the natural language that we use to describe things, then this data becomes information when you are able to translate this and convert it into a usable form that is, uh, mm, that you can extract information from that more in an efficient way because you have constructed relationships between your data points. In this case, we are using ontologies where you have your terms or classes you have relationships among those classes uh, and uh, your hierarchies represent correspondence between those different classes and relationships. This information up the road would become knowledge when you can include a context and experience to uh, describe patterns. And then you get wisdom when this uh, you are able to answer a question based on these patterns that you already recognized. So right now we are at the, this uh, step of, sorry, converting our natural language uh, descriptions into a more articulated uh, base knowledge where you can um, 
where uh, knowledge is more interoperable, not only between humans, but also among machines. So for example, here you have a maxilla, and when you talk about natural language, one this, uh, definition that has been given, this is a definition by Snodgrass, is that the maxillary basis is typically elongate and it's implanted by its entire inner surface on the pleural region of the head, just behind the mandible. On its dorsal extremity, it bears a single condyle by which it articulates with the lower lateral margin of the tergal region of the cranium. And this takes a little time for your own brain to process, but a machine can certainly not understand anything that is being said here. So that's why what we need to do is to use semantic annotations in order to tell the computer, hey, this particular word refers to a shape or refers to an area in a particular structure. And this particular word is a relationship between different terms. With this, we are able to uh, trace our knowledge and what is being said about those particular terms, um, not only within a document, but among different documents. So for example, here, um, the only uh, anatomy ontology that exists so far is uh, the Hymenoptera anatomy ontology. And there is a, it is a known database that anyone can consult. And each of these particular terms has a definition. And one of the things that I like the most about this particular ontology is that it tells you exactly in a figure what do you need to look for when you're looking at your specimen to recognize that that's the maxilla. An additional advantage of these kinds of systems is that they are all linked to each other. So for example, they each term would have a unique identifier that is uh, linked to a general database of terms in, on, in ontologies in general. So you have here your link, you have your term, and you have your definition. So in order to get there, what we are doing right now is compiling all this information about beetle anatomy to uh, edit our ontology. And for that, we are using a program called Protégé, where it can handle different hierarchies here. And for example, for the maxilla, you would have uh, properties that are exclusive of that one particular term, and also some other properties that are inherited from all the hierarchy up the tree. So this, the way this program works is that it uses uh, Manchester syntax that is a very specific way that you can connect terms to each other using different properties. So the idea is that with this project, we are going to obtain at some point uh, control vocabulary. So we would have a list of terms that are commonly used for anatomy ontology of beetles. Uh, part of it would be reusing terms that already exist in database. In databases, uh, we are also going to create our own terms that are exclusive for beetles, and we would also implement uh, sensu and usage because, as we as we know, um, some terms as are used to refer to different structures in different groups of beetles, or uh, the same term is used for different structures. So it's, uh, we need to uh, recognize which terms have been used in different groups and uh, include references for each of these. Almost as a byproduct of this, we will create an online illustrated glossary with fully labeled figures because one of the problems that you usually have when you're trying to get familiar with beetle anatomy or try to identify the beetles that you found in your backyard is that you cannot, with a key, it's difficult to, that is not illustrated or where the terms are not indicated, it's difficult to understand what do you need to look at in order to get to your ID. So these figures would be uh, fully labeled, also accompanied by a 3D model. Everything should be referenced and um, we will have examples across the order, ideally. Also, as a byproduct of this, we would produce a how-to guide, a 
um, how to edit your ontology, how to go to the next step, which is reasoning to clean up terms that are duplicated or terms that need uh, additional uh, relationships with other terms, and uh, also a part of versioning and updates, which um, this is not going to be a project that is going to have a definitive end because we can think of uh, additional information that needs to be ontologized in terms of anatomy, like uh, immature anatomy, uh, muscles, because right now we are only focusing on the uh, sclerotized section of the skeleton, but then you can add muscles, you can add soft tissue, and you can add all kinds of information that refer to the anatomy of a beetle. The applications of this kind of work have to do with uh, more efficient data mining, so you would be able to uh, construct uh, your uh, character matrices just mining data if you have these terms tagged in, uh, in an ontology. We can also think of semantic descriptions in the future, and uh, they have been already, uh, not, uh, ontologies have already been used as partition schemes for phylogenetics uh, based on morphology. And uh, we can also think of applications of artificial intelligence to phenotypes. So here I have a quick preview of the a demo for the website where the glossary is going to be hosted, where you would have your terms, you would have your natural language definitions here. Uh, everything should be referenced. Um, we would have this particular uh, drawing is taken from a publication, but ideally we would have our own illustrations with everything um, indicated. And also with uh, not only our list of references, but uh, links to each of those publications when they are available online. With this, I would like to thank the people and institution that, institutions that have uh, helped with, with my Weevil endeavors over time. Also, people and institutions that supported my research in aquatic beetles. All of, and I've been fortunate to uh, indirectly be fund, funded by NSF because both my projects at the University in Puerto Rico and the University at KU and in Kansas both of them, uh, my PIs, were NSF funded. Uh, also, thanks to the Natural Science Research Laboratory, which is where the, at the Museum of Texas Tech, where I, um, uh, where I do my volunteering, taking care of the collections. And lastly, to Aaron and all the team that are working with me in this uh, coleoptera ontology. And with that, thank you for staying here with me today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. That was great. Um, we put our thank yous in the chat, I suppose. So uh, for questions, if you could add them to the Q&A button, um, Jennifer can answer them as we go. Uh, and I will do my best to mark them all. Aha, says Bert, can you see the Q&A, Jennifer? Yes. Okay. okay, Matthew Dittman says, I think you mentioned that the type specimens for this Colombian species sometime, are sometimes in European collections. It seems odd to keep the type specimens in a place that far from its native range. I totally agree. Um, is there a benefit to that? Could those type specimens be repatriated? So the thing is that many of these things were described in the 1800s, early 1900s, and I don't think there was like a policy right back then about where types should go. <laughs> so uh, these are, many things are described of uh, Nueva Granada, which was the name for all of this, um, area composed now from Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador. Uh, so these are really old specimens. Can we repatriate it? I don't know. I wish. <laughs> uh, 
I guess right now the idea would be as there are many collections going through this uh, efforts to digitize their collections, maybe those types can be made available. Like, I think they, in many places, they are probably well taken care of, but then access is a problem. So I think with these efforts of digitizing collections, if types made it of this particular group, if types made it through uh, uh, digitizing efforts, it would be, it would help definitely because many of these things you can recognize them by their color pattern. At least having a model of this is how they look like would help with um, trying to identify them. Uh, Laura says, a beautiful group of beetles. I totally agree. <laughs> um, Yovan says, going back to the knowledge pyramid, what would wisdom ultimately look like in the context of the coleoptera anatomy? So I think um, at some point we should be able to, for example, if we have a complete um, network of, okay, this is the morphology of the larva, this is the morphology of the adult, and this is how it happened across these different groups. We could start asking questions of how these modifications happen in development, or if we had information, integrated information across the entire uh, coleoptera, we could ask questions of uh, how this morphology emerged. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's more like getting to answer questions about uh, the patterns that we uh, can see. I'm not sure if that answers. <laughs> uh, we have Leslie, uh, beautiful pictures of the beetles in great diversity. Yes, definitely. This actually, that's kind of one of the reasons why I got uh, involved with this. When I was an undergrad, you could choose which uh, theme you want to pursue. And because in Colombia and in many Latin American countries, you need to do a research project in order to graduate um, your undergrad. So I started looking at very different groups of uh, insects, like uh, robber flies and a group of um, um, true bugs. But then uh, this particular group and curculionids is just like a massive mess of many different things and in the collection we had tons and tons of specimens and for these particular groups for entimines uh, they would have the same phenotype uh, uh, classified in different subfamilies and this is a different uh, story that back then uh, entimines were separated in five or more different subfamilies and then we, they put them all together in the same group. So it took, it has taken a lot of time to be able to uh, compile information on this group to be able to get to this point where you could potentially start identifying species. Uh, Greg says, is there much current collection activity in those those parts of Colombia that you said have few collections. So one of the things is that uh, some of the collections that I haven't uh, visited yet have active programs where the students go collect in uh, natural preserves somewhere in the country. So they could potentially have material from around uh, Leticia, which is uh, the very tip south essentially of the country so we would have representation of Amazonian specimens but this entire south uh, east of the country is very remote like you can just get to some places by driving many hours in not super nice roads or by uh, taking a plane or a helicopter so it's not like you cannot go that very there very easily. Still, there are some uh, cities uh, in these areas, but they don't have active programs of collecting or 
doing research. So I think the most likely region that could be potentially studied in a little more detail would be the uh, Caribbean region in the north, but it's taking a lot of time. And also there are a couple of universities um, in this area in the Caribbean region that are only now starting their biology programs and programs with uh, research in entomology. So I think, I hope <laughs> in the near future, we can have uh, information from there. Uh, Tim Gibbs says, is there ever a place or value for behavioral characteristics in your pyramid? So the thing is that right now we are only focusing on anatomy. And that, of course, has implications on function. How can we integrate both? I'm not sure yet, but I think that's uh, probably a good thing to look at in the future. Let's see what we have in the chat. All right. We've got a minute for another question or two if you have them. And here we go. Okay. Uh, Drew says, regarding your Caribbean work, are there are the patterns you find consistent with the geological history of the islands? I guess I'm wondering about this personal and timing of island transformation. Uh, yes. So I think for um, Lacnopus especially, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, the, in order for us to be able to uh, put some time framework uh, into these questions. I think uh, one of the things that can be done is start using molecular data, for example, uh, when you are revising the whole group. And maybe these molecular data and time calibrated trees would start telling us about why are these things here? Where did they come from? Because the preliminary analysis that we have done of this is that uh, these things uh, arrived to the Caribbean islands through uh, Central America. And there are other studies in groups that are closely related to Lacnopus where they show um, the, what's the word? They colonized from the Caribbean to Central America. And I think uh, we need a lot more data in order to start getting to answer those kinds of questions. Hola Yar says, uh, great presentation, thank you. <laughs> I love the map showing the regions. We should meet and have a coffee, of course. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, um, even though I only was able to revise a few collections in Colombia, there's still a lot of information that needs to be grabbed from those collections. And the thing is that um, I'm trying to somehow magically recruit students to work with this group, but the the lack of information or at least uh, that this information is not compiled yet uh, makes things a little more difficult. All right. Well, thank you. Turn on my video. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah, great talk, Jennifer. I'll be the one thank you so much. Time. Thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for staying for this yeah. talk. And um, Jennifer will be at the grad student lunch at 12.30. Uh, and some point after COVID, we'll hopefully be visiting campus as well. Uh, uh, if you want to meet her in person in the future. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, cool. Have a great day. Uh, thank you all for coming.